So very good evening, everyone, and welcome to the talk this evening. The topic is something that could be fairly controversial. Could there be an alternative site for Kushinara, the place where the Buddha attained his Mahaparinibbana? Many of you would have thought, really? Could there possibly be another site where the Buddha passed away? Then what happens to the four holy places that you visited during your India pilgrimage? Did this change anything? Does this imply that there was a misidentification of the current site for Kushinara that the Buddhist goes to for the last 100 years? Now, how could this happen? What is the source of reference for the speaker for him to propose an alternative site why is it necessary to talk about an alternative site when you're already happy with the current one? Now, you have so many questions, and I hope that these will get addressed in the talk. Now, of course, going for pilgrimage. Going for pilgrimage is really important for those of us who profess to be Buddhist. This means going for a religious or a spiritual journey to a sacred place, such as a site, a shrine, a temple, or a stupa. According to the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, in the Diga Nikaya, which is a collection of long discourses, Sutta number 16, Buddhists are advised to go on a pilgrimage to the four holy places connected with the Buddha's life. His birth at Lumbini, his enlightenment at Budgaya, the place where the first sermon was taught at Saranath, or where he set in motion the will of Dharma, and his passing away at Kushinara. Of course, we accumulate tremendous merits by visiting these holy sites, and this strong positive karma could lead to heavenly births, according to the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. So during a pilgrimage, you will take refuge in the Triple Jam and deepen your connection to the Buddha, the Dharma, and Sangha. So, of course, these sacred sites are really important in any pilgrimage. But ultimately, it depends on your mental attitude during the pilgrimage. That is the one that counts. Merit is created with the mental connection when we go on a pilgrimage. If indeed there is another potential site for Kushinara, I will argue that it needs to be excavated and confirmed. If the site has been confirmed, then good, we have a new site to visit. But what happens to the earlier site that you have visited? Now, I would say that that's also meritorious because when you visited a site, your mind was full of devotion and that site must be uh, an ancient site of stupas and monasteries. So you have created tremendous merit. Um, well, how about Kushinara? Uh, the last three months of the Buddha's life was described in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, where the Buddha announced that he will pass away in three months' time at a Chapala shrine in Vishali. After that, he traveled with the monks northwards, and he passed through Pava, where he was offered his last meal by Chunda, the smith. The food, unfortunately, caused severe food poisoning to the Buddha as he traveled slowly towards the Sala Grove of the Malas in Kushinara, near the bank of the Hira Navate River. At that time, he was 80 years old. His body was frail and he was sick uh, with food poisoning. And you know how bad food poisoning could be with cramped stomach, throwing out. And uh, so this was very bad. The journey was slow and the Buddha was dehydrated and had to rest many times. Upon reaching the Sala Groves at Kusinara, the Buddha knew that he would have to pass, he will pass away. So he asked Ananda to prepare a bed between two flowering Sala trees for him to lie down with his head pointing to the north. At that time, the villagers were coming in droves to pay the last respect to the Buddha. And in the skies were throngs of celestial beings witnessing his passing away. At that time, Subhadda, a wandering ascetic managed to see the Buddha and was accepted as the last convert. And the last words of the Buddha was, I declare 
this to you. It is the nature of all conditioned things to perish. Strive on with mindfulness. So those were the last words of the Buddha. I declare this to you. It is the nature of all conditioned things to perish. Strive on with mindfulness. Now, how is Kushinara like during the time of the Buddha? In the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, section 517, Ananda complained to the Buddha that it was a miserable little mud wall town close to the jungle. He, Ananda asked the Buddha, why not choose some other great cities such as Champa or Rajagaha or Savati or Koshambi or Vanarasi, where there are many wealthy supporters who will give the Tathagata proper funeral rites. But the Buddha replied that Kushinara was once the capital of King Mahasudasana, who had been a righteous king with a vast territory. And during that time, uh, the city was prosperous and well populated. So um, in order to put the talk uh, in uh, some kind of timeline, in some kind of context, uh, after the Buddha passed away, 200 years after the Buddha, Emperor Ashoka visited the places connected with the Buddha for pilgrimage. That's when Emperor Ashoka became a Buddhist. Huh? So at each of these places, he erected stupas and pillars to mark the sites. In the fifth century, the Chinese monk Fasian in the seventh century, Xuanzang traveled to India. At that time, Buddhism was a living tradition with many followers. So people still know where these places are, where the holy places are. So when Xuanzang and Fasian visited these places, they kept records of what they witnessed. These records were found to be very accurate because they were being used to locate places connected with the Buddha. Now, 500 years after Xuanzang, India was attacked by the Kilji Turks from Afghanistan and the Buddhist sites and the monastics were all being targeted. So that was towards the end of the 12th century, that was 1100s. Uh, from the 13th, 13th century onwards, Buddhism declined rapidly from India and disappeared for 700 years. So all these places associated with the Buddha were completely forgotten. They were completely forgotten if not for the records of the Chinese pilgrims, okay? For 700 years, nobody knew anything about Buddhism or the Buddha. Now the translation of the records of the Chinese pilgrim, particularly that of Farsian and Xuanzang occurred in the 19th century, in 1800s. Huh? And it made po it possible for the British officers in colonial India to start looking for the places mentioned in the records. Among the well-known Buddhist of officers that led the archaeological excavations were Alexander Cunningham. So he is really our hero. And he's got an assistant by the name of Khalil. Yeah. Since India is vast and the Buddhist artifacts were widespread, some of these places were misidentified, even by experts like Cunningham and his assistants and other British uh, archaeologists. But this was later corrected by later excavations. So some of these places which they identified turned out not to be the places, okay? <laughs> but some of the places which they identified were, were correct, okay? Now, Kushinara was identified at Kastia, a town called Kastia, that is where Kushinara was. Uh, it was identified by Alexander Cunningham and, and Khalil. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name. Uh, who found a reclining statue of the Buddha buried in the ruins of the shrine and that became the basis to confirm Kushinara. Yet, even during this time, there was doubt raised about the accuracy of, of this finding. And this finding, as we know it, was 150 years ago. 150 years ago, that was the Kushinara that people go to. Now, two of the holy sites uh, were marked with Ashoka pillars, and they were in Lumbini as well as Sarana. Do, both these holy places, had Ashoka pillars. In the case of Budgaya, Ashoka built the original Mahabodhi Vihara and the railings. But the mark of Ashoka is strangely missing from Kushinara. There is nothing, there's no mark of Ashoka at Kushinara. And that is really quite strange because you know that Ashoka built stupas and, you know, some, uh, and the, um, uh, the pillars, uh, 
Ashoka pillars at these holy sites. So uh, we will hear from the speaker tonight on this matter, whether there could possibly be another site in North India where Koshinara was located, where the Blessed One passed away. Now, before I introduce the speaker, I just like to take a poll uh, because even the title itself is rather controversial. What is what if, when you listen to this talk, that you discover that there is another site for Koshinara, the place where the Buddha passed away? What would your response be? Is it going to be positive? Is it going to be negative? Or is it going to be neutral? Now, you can take the poll uh, by clicking on the comment uh, section of your Facebook. Uh, there is a link. Click that a link uh, for the Google form fill in your response, and then come back to the Facebook for the talk, okay? So I'll just give you a little bit of time. We just want to get a feeling for the audience that's listening to, that's about to listen to this talk. How do you feel about this topic? Is it going to be positive? Is, are you going to say, oh, wow, depart, fantastic. Or are you say, mm, I'm not very sure. Or are you going to say, oh, no, no, please don't tell me there's another site for, for Kushinara because I've been to Kushinara, I've done all my devotions, I've even made donations there. Don't tell me. So let us know whether it's going to be positive, neutral, or negative. And then we will get your response up on the screen, okay? So I'll just give you some time to fill up this poll. Meanwhile, let me just introduce to you our special speaker tonight. Our speaker is Deepak Anand, who is... He's a Buddhist pilgrimage explorer, and he's really passionate about Sun Chiang's journey to India 1,400 years ago. Now, of course, the main sources for Sun Chiang's records, uh, there are two books. Huh? One is called The Great Tang Records of the Western Region, and that's written by Sun Chiang. It's a very detailed. Sun Chiang was a very meticulous, very detailed in his description. And there is another book that we can refer to. It is called a biography of the Tripitaka master of the great Qian monastery of the great Tang dynasty. And this book is about Sun Chang's journey. It's written by his disciples called Li Hui and Shi Yan Tong. Okay. Now, uh, Sun Chang has given very detailed descriptions of the sites that he's visited, and they are invaluable for confirming the archaeological discoveries. Uh, Deepak has also written a book. It's called Pilgrimage Legacy of Sun Chang, which provides detailed maps of places and sites visited by Sun Chang. And this becomes a very good re reference in order to know where Sun Chang went uh, when you trace it on a map. Deepang himself had completed 2,000 kilometers of journey by foot, retracing Sun Chang's journey. And this event, when he completed the journey, was being uh, celebrated at the Nalanda Nava Mahavihara in India. Okay. Uh, Deepak at one time was, was at the Nan, uh, Nalanda uh, Nava Mahavihara. And uh, his journey was to retrace Sun Chang's uh, uh, journey. Uh, his uh, journey was, was actually found in what you call uh, the Nalanda Insatiable Offering. You go to his blog and then you can follow his journey. Okay, now I encourage you to click like and comment to this talk and we can certainly take questions uh, for us to spot the questions from your comments, just put a capital Q and then you type your questions, okay? So with that as an introduction, now before we go to introduction, introduction, can we have the response from that poll please, Alex? How does the poll look like? Oh, it's rather small for me. 22 people have responded. Wow, this is small. My glasses are obviously not very good. Six, 16, is it 60? Well, close to 70. 70 is positive and 30 is neutral. It is small. I need to get my, my, my lens uh, fixed. Okay, so that's all right. I hope that, uh, but there's nobody who's negative. I think those people who are negative will actually keep away from the talk. <laughs> that's all right. I hope that at the end of the talk, it is all going to be blue. It's all going to be positive. All right. So with that, let me just invite uh, Deepak to, uh, to, uh, to give us a talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. V. Good evening to all the viewers. So let me start my presentation. So let me share my screen. So is it uh, 
visible and am audible yes it's very good yes okay so good evening to all of you so this is my presentation on i mean dr v has already given a very good background but still i will uh, share with you the little background of uh, all these places uh, about this uh, buddhist heritage and, and why we are talking about this all these things so uh, let me start with the background so all of us know that uh, uh, buddha was born in lumbini in 6th century bc and uh, then he uh, at the age of 29 he left his home and he came to uh, uruvela the present day bodh gaya he got enlightened there and for next 45 years he made his wandering in the gangetic plain of india so this was uh, this happened some 2500 years ago 2600 years ago <clears throat> and after uh, like you know um, for, for next 1000 years 1500 years buddhism spread in uh, not in, only in indian subcontinent but it uh, it is spread in whole of this asian uh, asia uh, asia region so this is how buddhism spread in whole of asia in different century uh, and then uh, as uh, dr v was telling that in around 10th 11th century there was a uh, political uh, the new political climate was not very conducive for uh, sustenance of monastery and buddhist pilgrimage so uh, rapidly this buddhism declined in indian subcontinent uh, but uh, luckily it survived in all these neighboring countries Uh, and in india buddhism was totally uh, wiped out you know the people had no idea no clue for uh, next 400 500 years that uh, buddhism and buddha had indian origin or something i mean all this uh, local memory was lost and when this uh, colonial people when they were in india they were very like you know they could not make any meaning out of all this uh, buddha images spread in indian subcontinent in afghanistan pakistan present i mean present day pakistan afghanistan india in all this uh, everywhere they would see this images with like you know uh, big ear lobes and i mean this curly hair uh, so i mean they all they thought that uh, this is something to do with uh, some this is some deity which has uh, some ethiopian uh, african connection and this is the image of mahabodhi temple this was totally in ruins in 18th century and it was uh, i mean people were totally ignorant about its significance that buddha got enlightened here similarly all the buddhist images images of buddha spread in indian subcontinent it had assumed new names not only i mean images of the buddha the places also like uh, nalanda became badgaon uh, shravasti became sahit mahet i mean all the places they assumed new names so it was total confusion i mean people were totally ignorant uh then in 18th century uh, the people in neighboring countries all this uh, because all these countries were like you know they, they were uh, colonies of uh, european countries so uh, all these uh, people who were uh, this colonial uh, people, rulers there uh, many of them they became uh, like you know interested in the local religion so they started reading that local religion texts and uh, they started translating them so they found a big connection that all these countries they were following one religion that is a common religion that is buddhism and through their text they realized that uh, all this thing has to do something with india i mean they they, they found all those stories originating from india that they, they, they got to know through all those uh, buddhist literature uh, that uh, buddhism had indian origin and uh, uh, buddha was from somewhere from like you know in the subcontinent um, but i mean it still it was not very clear the geography of uh, buddhist uh, pilgrimage and buddhist sites were not very clear and in 1830s uh, travelogues of fashion was uh, translated the uh, buddhist monk who came to india in 5th century and uh, his travel accounts was basically his own foot journey which he took uh, the, the footsteps of the buddha pilgrimage which he took so he gave a very good, uh, he gave the description but his descriptions were not very detailed not very useful so uh 20 years later uh, the travelogues of uh, travelogues of shenzang the another chinese uh, um, uh, buddhist monk who came to india in 7th century his his travel accounts were translated and his accounts were so detailed and as uh, dr v was uh, uh, sharing with us that i mean his accounts were very very meticulously he prepared those accounts about all those places and distance and directions was very like you know very accurate so based on his description uh, all this uh, it was uh, revealed that the gangetic plain was the place where buddha made his wandering and all this important places associated with buddha the eight great places were were in this gangetic plain but still because all the names were changed all the places were as you new names and there were so many ancient remains in gangetic plain like you know you go in any direction you will find ancient remains some mounds some buddhist sculpture so there was lots of confusion in that
I sorry. I mean, hello. Yeah, 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 yeah. They sorry. kind of like hanged. I don't know what happened. He <laughs> hanged. <laughs> I think you can. <laughs> okay, sorry. So. Yeah. So uh, Shrantham description was very detailed. And uh, uh, Alexander Cunningham, who was pioneer in setting up this uh, uh, archaeological survey of India, so he was the, among the first people who started investigating and finding, locating the places mentioned by Shwenzang. But it was not an easy task because, I mean, at that time, the understanding about the geography, the level maps of the area was very crude. So these people, they faced lots of difficulty. And that is one reason why, I mean, many of the identification offered by uh, the 19th century explorers were uh, incorrect. And most of the, many of the identification offered by them were uh, later corrected. So, uh, uh, so in 1842, I mean, just giving a little background in 1842, um, this uh, uh, so Alexander Cunningham identified uh, the site of uh, Sankisa, the village Sankisa as uh, ancient Sankasya. They found this uh, Ashokan capital there, elephant capital there. So this was the basis of the identification. And similarly, uh, Alexander Cunningham also identified uh, Sahit Mahit as a site of Shravasti, ancient Shravasti, where Buddha spent 25 of his vasa, uh, the, uh, the rainy retreat seasons. And uh, also uh, during you know, some excavation that, uh, that Cunningham did, he found this image of Buddha on which there was an inscription mentioning that it is uh, Shravasti. So this is how it was confirmed that uh, Sahit Mahit is Shravasti. This was, I mean, like, you know, I'm just giving background how these identifications were done. So from Sh uh, Shravasti, the, from here, uh, Cunningham, based on friends and travelogue, I mean, he started exploring, and then he offered all these identification, like, you know, uh, this is the, the Bulia D, this uh, uh, site of Nagar, he identified as Kapilavastu. From Sh Shravasti, Shrenzang went to, Shrenzang and Fashian, both of them went to Kapilavastu, and from Kapilavastu, both of them went to Lumbini, the birthplace of the Buddha. From Lumbini, they went to Ramagrama, the place where Buddha's relic stupa was there. And from them, there, both of them went to the place where Buddha, uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha, in his renunciation, uh, cut his hair and sent back Chandaka and charioteer, his charioteer and his horse. And from there, both of them went to the site of Charcoal Stupa and uh, finally to Kushinagara. So, uh, based on strengths and description, uh, uh, Cunningham made, offered all this identification. And uh, on his trail, he finally mentioned the uh, Kasiya as the place where uh, Buddha attained Parinirvana, according to him. Some uh, 20 years later, his assistant Carlyle did, uh, I mean, did the follow-up work of uh, follow-up of what uh, this Cunningham had offered. So he made some suggestions and he offered new set of places uh, what Cunningham had identified. So this is this green line is the of uh, the fresh identification offered by Carlyle in 1875. So according to him, not Nagar, but Buliadi was the site of uh, Kapilavastu. Uh, similarly, uh, as uh, Cunningham has mentioned that Mokson village should be the site of uh, Lumbini. He saw some mentioned remains there. So uh, Carlyle corrected it and said, no, it should not be the place. He offered this place, Sherpur, Sh Sh as the site of Lumbini. But I mean, th this is like in all this identification of all those places, which Shrenzan mentions from uh, Shravasti to Kushinagar, this was the identification offered by both these uh, explorers. But both of them agreed about Kasiya, that Kasiya should be the place of Buddha's Mahaparinirvana. So this is the, this when Cunningham visited this place in uh, 1860s, so this was the ancient remains. I know this is the sketches, this is the first sketch prepared by uh, uh, Cunningham. So these are the mounds uh, at uh, which uh, Cunningham noticed that Kasiya. And then in 1875, uh, Cunningham asked uh, Carlyle to make excavation at this site. So this site, I mean, this is the, this was called Matha. Local people to, told him that this is called Matha Kuvarka Court. I mean, uh, uh, remains of dead prince. So when uh, Carlyle make ex made excavation, so this revealed this remains of this temple. And this, uh, this you can see this is, I mean, still out. Uh, protruding out, outside. I mean, this is still, it's visible here. So after excavation, it looks something like this. So this is Nirvana temple. It was totally in bad shape, fallen. And this uh, stupa was also in very bad shape. So, uh, and so after the excavation, this is the plan which was revealed by uh, Caroline. Uh, so he found that this temple, this is the temple which he discovered. This is the temple. Uh, this is the temple which uh, he discovered, you know. And this is this is the 
temple because this was not the first temple this was the temple which is discovered but before this there was temple existing the, uh, because i mean all at all these sites there are i mean temple erected once the temple falls down they erect a new temple so before this there was another temple so he saw remains of a earlier temple at uh, at the site uh, similarly this is the remains of this uh, stupa and this is the grand plinth on which both this uh, temple uh, temple and the stupas are resting so uh, but the major find was this reclining image of the buddha which he discovered Car carlyle discovered so this is the sketch prepared by carlyle so this uh, uh, this image of buddha is 20 feet long sandstone statue of buddha and this statue is from later late 5th century i mean uh, around 470s or 480s something like that and this uh, image also had an inscription which uh, which mentioned that this uh, image was offered by the chief abbot of the monastery which was existing at kasia uh, his name was uh, haribala so he offered this uh, this image at, at kasia so this was a very demonstrative uh, like you know find and this people took it for granted that uh, this image has been found so this has to be like you know because this is image of mahapandirvana buddha such a big statue so people took it like you know that yes this is uh, kasia is kushinagar uh but in 1890s uh, three ashokan pillars were discovered in nepal i mean present in nepal in terai region uh, three ashokan pillars were discovered they were broken and totally buried so two of these ashokan pillars had inscription and this pillar which was discovered at rumandi it, it its inscription read that uh, uh, this is the birthplace of the buddha it is lumbini birthplace of the buddha and uh, emperor ashoka visited this place and similarly this ashokan pillar which was discovered at negliwa it mentioned that this is the place of kanakmuni buddha and, uh, and so, so i mean uh, these three pillars because shrenzang in this description mentions about three ashokan pillars uh, near kapilavastu which was to mark the place of birthplace of the buddha and places of kanakmuni and karapchan buddha this was the previous buddha before gautama buddha so once these sites were this places this pillars were discovered uh, so all this identification of uh, uh, kapilavastu and uh, uh, lumbini and all those places this 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 is the site where all these pillars were discovered this is negliwa this is gothiyawa karakchunda buddha place and this is rumandi which the third ashokan pillar was discovered here so once this ashokan pillars were discovered in 1890s so all this identification offered by carlyle and cunningham in 1860s and 70s were now null and void like you know now they were meaningless because Shrenzang mentioned about this Ashokan pillars, and Ashokan pillar has got inscription which mentions about uh, um, these places. So all these sites were now null and void. But somehow, because this very demonstrative uh, evidence that this is uh, image of Buddha in uh, like you know, reclining Buddha, Mahaparinirvana Buddha, so nobody touched it. I mean, they took it for sure that I mean, no, I mean, though this is correct, but this 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 is also correct. but there were few archaeologists few explorer at that time especially uh, vincent uh, smith he he doubted this thing you know he said that uh, no uh, uh, because i mean uh, this image has been found there but still this is not a conclusive evidence so according to vincent smith uh, he said that uh, shrenzang and fashian both of them they went towards east uh, from uh, lumbini and uh, east and then so this is the basically the trail of shrenzang and fashian according to uh, uh, vincent smith so he according to him uh, the uh, the kushinagar should be somewhere here i mean this place uh, indo nepal border somewhere here uh, further uh, north of kastia so uh, at that time the director general of archaeological survey of india uh, john marshall he found uh, this uh, i mean this proposal this doubt raised by vincent smith very logical and he said i mean let's uh, do some excavation at kasia and uh, let's see i mean let's try to find uh, some conclusive evidence whether kasia is kushinagar or not and uh, let's uh, i mean like you know let's try for some conclusive evidence and let's settle this uh, debate forever so he instructed two of his assistants j vogel and hiranand sastri to do excavation at uh, uh, at kasia so well, this excavation happened for 5 years so i would share with you what were the important finds at uh, kasia by the in, during the excavation by j vogel so this is uh, the great plinth i mean this is uh, this is this the, this is this uh, structure 
which uh, Vogel excavated. So first thing is that it was not completely excavated. It was only partially excavated. So what they found, uh, as, as we uh, discussed that, I mean, this was a temple which was discovered, like, you know, this was a temple which was discovered, which was uh, like, you know, uh, when Caroline did remove it, when he removed all those de debris, so he found this temple. And uh, this temple, according to him, because at that time when they did all this excavation, dating was not very, like, you know, very methodically done and it was like, you know, very crude, but still he dated it like, you know, 10th or 11th century uh, so in a very later phase of uh, Buddhism. And then uh, he noticed there are remains of another temple below this. So, but this temple below this, it had recessed corner, you know, you can see this is the recessed corner of this temple. So based on this find, they concluded this temple should be from 7th, 8th century. And uh, they didn't do any further excavation. But since the image lying in this temple was from 5th century, and this temple was from 7th, 8th century, so there has to be a temple in 5th century to house this uh, colossal image of 20, 20 feet Buddha image, which was offered by Haribala. So based, they didn't do any excavation, but they speculated this red dot. I mean, I put this dotted line. So uh, Vogel speculated there must have existed this temple here. They didn't find any, any evidence, but they concluded, I mean, just because, I mean, there was an image here from fifth century. So they thought there should be a temple. They didn't find any evidence. So they thought that uh, they, they, they concluded there should be a temple here. When they were doing some little excavation of this plinth, this square base. So here they found some, some, some shelf, a niche with, I mean, image of Buddha. So based on that image of Buddha, they didn't do complete excavation of this. They just did some partial excavation here. They opened this place little and they found this niche with this shelf with images of the Buddha. So based on that, they, they concluded that this, this niche, this, this images of the Buddha are from Kushana period, from second century. So according to them, uh, this structure, I mean, they didn't do prop, full excavation, but they just based on this, uh, this shelf and this image of the Buddha, they concluded this structure is a stupa. So first, first structure is this, the, the, the last structure is this temple from 10th, 11th century. Before this, this, this is the temple from uh, 7th, 8th century with recessed corner. And then they hypothesized, uh, the, then they speculated that, uh, made a guess that there must, have, there must be a temple from uh, 5th century where this uh, Haribala offered this image of the Buddha. And before that, there was a Kushana period, 2nd century AD, a stupa was there. They didn't do proper excavation to whether there was a temple or stupa, it's just a guesswork. And uh, further what they found was that uh, you see these blue dot, dots. So these blue dots are stupas. I mean, these are the stupas. And this plinth was resting on this stupa. I mean, so this stupas should predate this plinth. If this plinth is from 2nd century C, so this stupa should be before this 2nd century C. 2nd uh, century uh, C. So According to them, this stupas may be from Orient period or maybe, I mean, second century, third century BCE, second century BCE. They didn't do any excavation, but they noticed that all these stupas, you can see, they are, they are oriented somewhere pointing towards there in center. So based on this guess, they, thought, they speculated that inside this plinth, inside this plinth, I mean, to put in perspective, this is the grand plinth. So they speculated that inside this, there should be a stupa this blue dot uh, from very early period. And that should be the main shrine which was erected at this place first. Had they, if they did excavation, they would have, uh, they didn't do any excavation. So this is basically a conjecture. This is just a guess. And further than that, I mean, this, the, the, this is the stupa behind this temple. So when they discovered this site, the stupa circumference, this is the circumference of, uh, circumference of the stupa when this uh, site was discovered. So this is 180 feet uh, round. But uh, uh, Vogel spec uh, said that, I mean, originally this may not be this wide because this temple from 7th, 8th century with this, this recessed corner, it was overlapping this, uh, this, this uh, stupa. So during 7th, 8th century, the stupa must be small to accommodate this temple. So uh, according to Vogel, this uh, stupa was uh, built in like, you know, maybe around fifth century, uh, later fifth century. I will come to this stupa later in detail, uh, talk in detail, but uh, this, this uh, uh, all evidences suggested that uh, this stupa was uh, uh, constructed 
uh, three times. I mean, they were uh, three times the stupa was constructed. Now, Carlyle, who didn't do any excavation, he just made some clearances here. So he mentioned that uh, Shenzhang had mentioned that there was an Ashokan stupa. They're very huge. So according to Carlyle, this was the Ashokan stupa. And Shenzhang also mentioned about an Ashokan pillar, which was installed at the place where Buddha attained Mahaparinirvana. So uh, Carlyle speculated that that pillar, you should find uh, pillar somewhere here. He didn't make any excavation. So when Vogel made excavation, excavation of this place, he didn't found any remains of pillar anywhere. Like, you know, uh, according to Carlyle, this was a brick platform and pillar must be raised on, uh, on this uh, platform. But uh, excavation revealed that this platform is from 7th century. It was a stupa, unusual, uncommon kind of stupa, a, a different kind of stupa from 7th century. And no trace of any Ashokan pillar were found here. And then uh, Vogel made some excavation here also to see if he can locate the uh, Ashokan pillar. He didn't find any remains here also. So uh, this the central shrine of Kasia didn't find, there was no conclusive evidence of uh, like you know ancient Ashokan stupa and Ashokan pillar nothing was found. Uh, so this is Grand Plinth. This is uh, yeah Grand. So Grand Plinth was still not excavated. So we still do not know what is inside this Grand Plinth. Uh, though this archaeologist uh, speculate this uh, have speculated th there must be some stupa inside this temple this below this temple inside this plinth from Mauryan period or from Buddha's time but since no excavation has happened so we do not know what is inside that now coming to this image of the Buddha which is like you know most demonstrative uh, thing which is uh, which was found at Kasia and this became the basis of identification of Kasia as Kushinagar and uh, this is a stone image so the point is this image is from 5th century and Shrenzang visited in 7th century. So the point is, did Shrenzang saw this image? Because uh, if Shrenzang visited, if Kasia is Kushinagar, then Shrenzang must have seen this image because at the time of Shrenzang, this image was existing. But if you read, these are the, uh, these are the cuttings. This is the screenshot of uh, uh, Shrenzang's uh, translation uh, up for, for, for Kushinagar. So I have brought, I have, uh, these are the screenshots of three translations of uh, Shrenzang. This is by uh, Thomas Waters, this is by Samuel Beale, and this is Ron C. So I have highlighted it, you know, what Shrenzang says, there is a statue of the Thagata. Again, the Waters, uh, Waters has translated it as an image, or in bracket he has mentioned representation. Representation means, uh, Thomas Waters is not sure, but the symbol used by Shrenzang for Kasia image, is, uh, I mean, he thought it can be image also, it can be representation. Representation means, I mean, something painted on the wall of the temple of the shrine. And again, this is uh, Bill, he says, it, which is a figure. So the point is like, you know, Shrenzang has, if you read Shrenzang's description about other places he visited, he is very specific about the images in the central shrine, especially at the eight great places, Shravasti, Sankasya, Bodh Gaya, at all these places, he has given a very detailed description about the of, of the uh, images in the central shrine of this uh, main shrine of the uh, site. Like, you know, I have brought some, uh, this are some screenshot I've shared about what Shrenzang says at Sankisa. Like at Sankisa, he saw a stone image. You see, he clearly says it is a stone image. He has given such a detailed description about, uh, about the temple and detail of the central shrine, what, is, what he saw at central shrine. And the image of the Buddha was a stone image. I mean, generally, at the time, I mean, ancient times, the central shrine, the image in the central shrine would be made of stuccos. So every time Shrenzang would say something central shrine image, which is not stucco and is made up of stone or brick or something else, he would mention it because this was an unusual thing. Similarly, at Shravasti, he clearly mentioned it's the image is five feet high. Uh, at Bodhgya, he has given such a detailed description about the image. You can see whole paragraph is just on image. I mean, the land, breadth, dimension, it's the, 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 I mean, like the facial feature and other marks on the image of the Buddha. Such a detailed description. And if you see what Shrenzang says at uh, Kushinagara, it's like, you know, it's a shrine is not very prominent and the image is not very great. And uh, certainly what Shrenzang saw was not a stone image and not 20 feet, feet Buddha image. Had it been, had Buddha seen, the, had Shrenzang seen this image of uh, Mahaparinirvana Buddha, uh, which is at Kasia, he would have definitely mentioned in detail about, because this image is so beautiful and I mean, its feature is so live. So, I mean, but Shrenzang is totally like, you know, he's, he has given very, one of the most uh, briefest description about the central shrine is that Kushinagar. So uh, I have doubts that uh, Shrenzang visited Kasia. I mean, 
Kasi I is question nagar I doubt it because of this uh, uh, this observation. Similarly, this uh, similarly this another uh, thing is that uh, Mahaparinirvana Nirvana images of the Buddha uh, were already uh, in circulation since second century C. Uh, and the, according to archaeologists, the first image of the Buddha at uh, Kasia I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, Deepak is speaking from uh, part nine, India. So sometimes there could be some uh, problems with the line. So we just have a little, a little patience. Yeah. We'll see whether he could get reconnected. Ah, okay. All right, Deepak, you're back again. Sorry, we lost you. <laughs> I mean, from where it is happening? It's happening from my side or what? From your side, I think, yes. Oh, I'm really sorry. I don't know why it's happening. Huh. Yeah. So now the first images of the Buddha were in circulation. The Mahaparinirvana Buddha were in circulation since 2nd century CE. And the first images which were discovered at Kasia were from, from 5th century. So there's a big gap of 300 years. So, I mean, this is very unusual. I mean, the site where Buddha attained Mahaparinirvana, why should the image of the Buddha be, come so late? I mean, three centuries after uh, the first images were in circulation. Uh, similarly, I mean, uh, coming to this uh, stupa, this big stupa, which according to Carlyle should be Ashokan stupa. So, uh, so Hiranan Sastri did excavation of this, uh, this uh, uh, stupa in 1910. And uh, so this top part was like, you know, uh, he dismantled it. It was made up of reused bricks and uh, uh, so this is this, he excavated this part. So this is like, you know, this is this, and this is the base. So at, uh, at the center in the middle, somewhere here uh, at this point, he discovered a, a copper vessel. And this copper vessel had a plate on the top of it. Uh, this, uh, this copper vessel and this plate uh, had this Nidana Sutra inscribed on this plate. I mean, it was not inscribed properly. I mean, like, you know, first two lines were inscribed. Later, uh, later uh, inscription was uh, through ink. So, uh, and it, it mentioned that this uh, Haribala, the monk in the fifth century, he deposited this uh, copper vessel in the stupa. And this, uh, this vessel had uh, burnt charcoal, cowries, precious stones, silver coin from Gupta period, Kumar Gupta, and copper tubes and one gold tube. And this gold tube had some liquid. And the chemical analysis that they did, they didn't find any, any uh, human remains. I mean, human bones, nothing was found. So they did further ex down, they, they, they excavated further down, and here they found this stupa. I mean, this stupa they found inside this. So this stupa was somewhere here. So this stupa was like, you know, nine feet, uh, three inches big. And this stupa is from early fifth century. So uh, now, uh, according to excavation, the first stupa at this site was from fifth century, which was nine feet big. In seventh, in, uh, in later fifth century, monk Haribala created a larger stupa. And he, he put this uh, copper vessel inside this stupa. Uh, and uh, and in, in maybe in 8th or 9th or 10th century, this stupa was further enlarged. And this became very huge stupa. But still, uh, you know, uh, uh, so the stupa, the first stupa at this site, at this site is only 9 feet 3 inches big, only this big. I mean, this plinth is only, this plinth is like 10 feet big. So the stupa is, this stupa was is somewhere here, inside here at this length. So uh, the Carlyle's speculation that Ashokan stupa mentioned by Shrenzang should be, this should be the Ashokan stupa is, is incorrect. We have still not found the uh, Ashokan stupa mentioned by Shrenzang. And the first stupa at this site, I mean, just imagine the site where Buddha attained Parinirvana, the first stupa at that site was created only in fifth century. 
uh, I mean, the, 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 the central stupa, the main stupa uh, is from 5th century. So this is very late. I mean, now coming to the monastery, uh, the main shrine, this is the main shrine. And this shrine is sh surrounded by monastery, uh, lo lots of monastic units. So based on archaeological excavation and dating, they have found that the first monastery was here uh, during the 2nd century, 3rd century BCE. This was a small monastery. And later in Kushana period, all these monasteries were created. One, this one, two, three, four, and uh, this monastery also. So these monasteries were created in fourth, fifth, uh, in second century, and it lasted up to fifth century. And this, uh, when these monasteries were like you know in a bad shape, they constructed this new monastery in fifth century. And this monastery was very huge. It is from uh, it. It was according to excavations, uh, they have confirmed that this is this monastery may be three stories big. So. This was a very flourishing center with lots of monastics living here. I mean, just to put in perspective, I mean, this is the shrine, the Nirvana temple, and you can see it is surrounded by monasteries. So when Fashian visited this site in fifth century, so these monasteries must be in a very working condition and lots of monks should be living here. Similarly, when Shrenzang visited, so this site, this mon mon monastery and uh, uh, another monastery here, I mean, this both this monastery must be working in a, in a good shape. So this monastery was three stories. So they were, uh, I guess there must be lots of monks living here. But still, Fashian is also silent about any mon uh, monks and monk community living at uh, Kushinagar. And Shrenzang doesn't even mention it. I mean, I'm just taking you to what Shrenzang and Shrenzang mentions about other sites which he has visited. Like at Sankasya, he, he mentions uh, there are four Buddhist monasteries and above 1,000 monks of Samatya school. So Shrenzang not only mentions about the existing monastery, monastery in ruins, and number of monks, and the tradition which they are following. Similarly, at Kapilavastu, he saw more than 1,000 monasteries in bad shape, in ruins. Still, he says that near the capital city, he found a monastery which had got which had 80 monks living there. So this is the kind of description Shrenzang shares about any site. Like at Shravasti, again, he says there are some hundreds of Buddhist monasteries of which the most were in ruins. And the monasteries which were in good condition were, uh, were following Samitya tradition. Similarly, at Ramagrama, uh, he mentions about uh, a small monastery which had the Samniers so who lived there and they took care of the site, the stupa. Similarly, at Charcoal Stupa, he mentioned about an old, old monastery. I can quote it for all the sites. I mean, Shrenzang, all the sites, wherever Shrenzang went, whatever he observed about monks and monk community and uh, the monastery is in good shape, monastery in bad shape, he has mentioned all those things. But if you see, this is the description of Fashian. I mean, Fashian is totally silent about this. this is the small description of Fashian from uh, Kushinagar. And he is totally silent about any monk or monk community living there. Instead, he says, the city, city which is like, you know, the city uh, where Chumda's house was there, who offered the last meal to the Buddha. So that house, according to the place of Mahavnirvana, was like one or two kilometers uh, south of the place where Buddha attained Mahaparnirvana. So he says the monks are not living at the site uh, where Buddha attained Mahaparnirvana, the temple where Mahaparnirvana, there was no monastery or monk living at the site of uh, temple. But monks were living in the city. And that too, like, you know, very few. A few monks uh, living in this uh, city. Um, so, at the time of Fashian, uh, this monasteries must be flourishing. And yet, Fashian says there were no monks living there, and there were no monk uh, community. I mean, like you know, the, the whole place was in a very bad shape. Uh, similarly, this is the description of Shrenzang from Kushinagar. I mean, uh, and he is totally silent. He has not at all mentioned about monastery, good, bad, uh, and any monk. He there was no monk there. So probably maybe Kushinagara was not a very like, you know, very flourishing center because as we know, Buddha in his Mahaparnirvana journey, this was not a very chosen place. He was on his way from Pawa to Kushinagar and uh, somehow, I mean, his, uh, uh, his health deteriorated very rapidly in midway when he reached this Sala Grove in the, close to this Ajavati Aja, river. So he didn't. He discontinued his further journey. So he he ultimately attained Nirvana in, in a very uh, place which was like you know, uh, which was like you know maybe flood prone or something which was not very suitable for uh, developing big structures. So this is the Shrenzang's description. I mean, he's totally silent about any monk, any monk community, any uh, uh, monastery at uh, Kushinagar. 
Now coming to seal and ceilings. This is these are not the seal and ceilings from uh, Kushinagar uh, or Kasia or anywhere. It is these are Harappan uh, seal and ceilings. I just wanted to give some perspective about what is a seal and what is ceiling. So this is seal die. So these ceilings, these are the impression of this uh, seal. So at Kasia, there were few seal dies discovered and many impressions discovered. So let's see what uh, what was uh, discovered at uh, Kasia. So at Kasia, more than 500 uh, uh, ceilings were discovered, uh, which had uh, mentioned, uh, uh, like you know, the which was mentioned, uh, which had inscription saying Mahapanirvana Vihara Bhikkhu Sangasya or Monastery of Great Disease, the, the, the Monastery of Great Disease. So there were more than like you know 500 such ceilings were found, and these ceilings were from 400 CE to 1000 CE. And all these ceilings were broken. So the people who excavated, who Vogel, who discovered all the ceilings, he said that, uh, uh, and all these ceilings had impression on their back. On their back, they, there was an impression um, suggesting that they were uh, they were attached with some strings with this all these manuscripts and some scriptures. So when this uh, the recipient when he received all this uh, this uh, manuscripts and uh, scriptures, they had to break these seals to open these manuscripts. That is why they found all the ceilings were broken. And all these ceilings were found in the, in the dump yard. I mean, in, in the dumping, I mean, the refuse heap. It was found in refuse heap. So according to uh, Vogel, uh, Kasia was a rec recipient of uh, Mahapanirvana uh, ceilings and they were not issuing this, they received it. That is why they were all broken and they were found in, in, in refuse. They reused it and they threw it. And another find at uh, Kasia was they, they discovered few seal dyes. I mean, seal dyes means uh, this thing from where the seals are produced. So this seal dye, one of the seal dye had mentioned Vishnu Deep Vihara Bhikkhu Sangasya, the community of monks of convent of Holy Vishnu Deepa. So Vethya Deepa is the place where, like, you know, this was one of the recipients of the eight, uh, the Buddha relics were distributed among the eight, eight uh, recipients. So Vishnu Deepa was the one of the places which received the uh, Buddha relics. And another uh, ceiling was uh, growth of noble eight. So probably, the, I mean, again, there's a confusion because there are eight great places. So Kushinagar is one of the eight great places. And again, there are eight relics distributed. So uh, there were eight relics to pass. So this could mean either. But this, uh, but since we didn't find even a single uh, seal die. I mean, seal die of uh, Mahapanirvana Monastery. Though we found more than 500 ceilings, but we didn't find any seal die, and we found one seal die of Vishnu Deepa Vihara Bhikkhu Sangasya. So Vogel. I mean, this is a conclusion drawn by Vogel. I'm, I'm not. I'm just quoting him. So he said that probably Kasia was a recipient of uh, Mahapanirvana seals. I mean, this uh, seals ceilings. So these ceilings came from some other place, which was somewhere associated, some way associated with the monastery of Kasia. And he also speculated that it is possible that uh, this is the site of uh, uh, Vethya Deepa. I mean, the, so according to him, the central shrine inside this, uh, which they didn't discover, which they didn't excavate it further. So according to them, this the central shrine inside this grand plinth could be the stupa, the relic stupa of Vethya Deepa people. Because, uh, so this is, I mean, what he said, he said that this is not a conclusive evidence to say that uh, uh, Kasiya is Kushinagar. And this is highly possible that Kasiya may be Vishnu Deepa. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm quoting him. I mean, this is what he has said. So now, uh, coming to what, I mean, like, you know, as I mentioned that uh, John Marshall initiated excavation on the request of uh, uh, Vincent Smith that we should find some conclusive evidence to conclude whether Kasia is Kushinagar or not. So this is the excavator who excavated in two seasons in 1904, five and five, six. So he did two excavations and he said at present the Kasia clay seals cannot be uh, said to afford a conclusive evidence the one or the other way with regard to the great, great topographical problem means the problem of identification of Kasia is Kushinagar. Similarly, the other excavator who did excavation of uh, after uh, Vogel, I mean, he did the excavation for three years and uh, he was also not very sure, I mean, to conclude based on what has, he has found. And especially he made the excavation at uh, Ramabhar, I mean, the stupa, which now we take as the site where Buddha's relics were distributed and he was cremated. And he said, this, this needs more excavation, it needs more exploration. I mean, this is how he concluded. He could not have been 
uh, I mean, this is a very uh, diplomatic way to say that. I mean, this is still uh, we are not. This is not a conclusive evidence. He said this uh, uh, still requires indisputable solution. So whatever they have found, it's not the conclusive evidence. It's still the question remains. And this was the last excavation which happened in 1912. And after that, no excavation has happened. So the problem of identification of Kasia with Kushinagar is still inconclusive. So now coming to like, you know, uh, as uh, uh, so where should we look for if Kasia, so all these identification were wrong. And even this was not a conclusive evidence based on excavation done by Vogel and uh, uh, Hiranan Sastri. So now question is, where should we look for uh, Kushinagar? So according to, I mean, uh, Shranzang and Fashian, both of them, they went east. And from east, they went southeast uh, to the place where Charkol Stupa was there. And from there, they went, uh, Shranzang went northeast to the place where Buddha attained Nirvana. And at the place of Buddha Nirvana, Shranzang saw two, stupa, two pillars, two Ashokan pillars to mark the place, a uh, first uh, pillar to mark the place where Buddha attained Nirvana, and another pillar to mark the place where he was cremated and his relics were distributed. And uh, uh, if you follow Shenzang and Fashan description from Lumbini, so Rama Grama, it is another identified site in Parsa in Nepal. So from here, if you go follow Shenzang and Fashan description, you will reach Rampurva. So at Rampurva, you will find there are two Ashokan pillars which were found like you know separated uh, 300 meters apart. But for safety reasons, in 1907-8, it was brought and kept at uh, this single one place for its safety because when it was discovered it was already fallen and in very bad shape so for its safety they have brought it here so rampurva is fulfilling two important criteria first is the distance and direction mentioned by shrenzang and fashian and another is these two ashokan pillars which was found there so now let's see i mean let's explore further so what is Shenzhen's description of Kushinagar? So, according to Shenzhen, there was an old city uh, which was like you know ten li in circuit, which was in very bad shape, and uh, it was old capital. And this was the place where Chunda's house was there, and he saw an Ashokan stupa to mark the place uh, of Chunda's house. And he says from here, three fourth li northwest means like you know two kilometers from here, around two kilometers. There was uh, after crossing the river Ajavati. Uh, he, there was a sala grove, and here he saw this uh, temple of uh, Nirvana, where the image of Buddha was there. And close to this, I mean, again, I have used all this word. I mean, Shrenzang uses uh, this phrase often, by side, not far, by side. So this can be anywhere, like, you know, I have just projected, but this can be here, this can be here, this can be here, because this is, he's not mentioning direction. He's saying by side. So based on my experience, I have seen this by side and near, not far. These phrases could mean up to like, you know, sometimes up to sometimes like one or two kilometers also. I mean, this is what I observed in both Gaya and some other places in like Nalanda and Rajgir. So these phrases are very dicey when Shrenzan uses this phrase. It could, it could mean also like, you know, 10 meters or 20 meters, but sometimes it can go up to four or five kilometers also. So then here he saw one Ashokan pillar to mark the site where Buddha attained Nirvana. So be, just close to this Nirvana temple, there was the Ashokan stupa and close to stupa was this pillar. And then he mentioned the place of cremation. He says it's north of, this is northwest and this is north. And north he goes, the, the, there was a stupa to mark the place where Buddha was burnt. Another stupa where uh, Buddha revealed his uh, legs to Mahakashapa. And close to it was the stupa and pillar to mark the place where Buddha's relics were distributed. So these are two Ashokan pillars. Uh, according to Shenzhen. So if you put this description on what uh, Carlyle and Cunningham had speculated about all those locations in uh, Kasia, so according to them, this village Anirudhva is the place where, which according to them was the city, ancient city. But, uh, and he spotted many mounds here, which he, then again, all these mounds, he, I mean, this is all guesswork. If you read his book, it's very like, you know, sometimes you find it very funny. So, when Hiran and Sastri, he did excavation at this site, he didn't find any conclusive evidence. He found no evidence. He just touches it and I mean, he found three or four stupas and he didn't find any remains to talk further or to do more exploration or excavation. He left it. So this is, I mean, if Ramabhar, according to, uh, according to Carlyle and uh, Cunningham is the place where Buddha's relics were distributed. But according to Shenzang, it is north of the city and this is like, you know, east of city. 
uh, which is uh, totally like you know um, uh, not in consonance with what Strenzang has said. Another thing is that uh, uh, both of them are a little confused because uh, the city, according to Strenzang and Fashian, was the power because this was the place where Chunda offered uh, food. And we know from Pali literature that Chunda offered food at Pava and not Kushinagar. So both of them thought this is Kushinagar and both of them offered their identification of power. So according to Strenz Cunningham, the power was Padorna, which was like 13 miles from here. Uh, north northeast of uh, Nirvana Temple, Kasia, and according to Carlyle, it was somewhere this side again, ten miles. So this is again totally absurd because according to Shrenzang, this is this should be power. If if if, if uh, the city close to Nirvana Temple was power and not Kushinagar, Kushinagar Buddha was on his way to Kushinagar from power, and then he had not reached Kushinagar according to uh, Pali literatures. So now let's put uh, what Shrenzang description. Uh, how it goes with Rampurva. So this is Shrenzang description and this is the find at uh, Rampurva. So these are two Ashokan pillars which was discovered. These are separated by like you know 300 meters. And I have uh, time and again, I have visited uh, Rampurva and this all these dots are, I have put, these are all ancient remains. If you go in these fields, you will find ancient remains there, you know, B pottery, brick, uh, um, um, bricks and uh, pot sheds. But the important thing is that if you notice, this is uh, this is the current river which is flowing past. I mean, the, this two Ashokan pillar. This is this river is called Hargoda. And uh, but if you notice, these are all ancient river bed. This is ancient river bed. This is a, like you know all this. This is full of. You can see. I mean, this is all river bed. This whole site is river bed, and rivers was passing past these pillar sites. You can see this is the river. Uh, so this is like you know river bed. Uh, this is river bed, which is going. And again, this is river bed. I mean, like, and at some point of time, this river flowed like this. So, Kushi, I mean, uh, we know that uh, this was not a chosen place by Buddha. I mean, this was, uh, he was forced, he was forced to not, uh, he was forced to discontinue his journey to uh, Kushinagar. So, uh, this was not a very favorable place. And it was by a riverside. And this was a, as this, uh, uh, image is uh, revealing that this was all full of uh, uh, this. This, this uh, has remained a riverbed. This is why, one reason why Fashian and Shrenzan didn't find Mong community here. Uh, uh, so let's come to what was discovered at uh, Kasia at uh, Rampurva. So this is the Ashokan pillar which was discovered. When discovered, it was like you know lying flat. It uh, as if it uh, somebody has fallen it. So one thing what you will notice is that this is layer of clay, this is la layer of sand, and this is like you know 15 feet. You can see this is the scale. This is more than. So when they discovered this uh, pillar, the pillar was buried inside the earth, and the base of the pillar was more than 15 feet from the surface. So this suggests that I mean this site was I mean this uh, 10 feet of sand reveals suggest that. This site, the river was flowing past this pillar site for centuries, not, I mean, like in you know, a day or two, it was for centuries, 100, 200, 300, 400 years. That's why there's a thick deposit of sand. And this area is full of, full of uh, each year it receives flood. I mean, it's always flooded. If you go in month of uh, August, September, uh, July, August, September, it is flooded. It's full of water. And, uh, and, and sometimes like, you know, in every 10, 20 years, the flood is very massive. So probably uh, all the structures which Shrenzang and Fashian saw in later century, it was fallen by the flood and all of them uh, are buried. Like, you know, this is when this northern pillar was excavated. So you can see, I mean, they are removing it from this site and you can see these are people standing on the surface. How deep it is. I mean, how deep it is. Like, you know, it's more than 15 feet. The base of this pillar is 15 feet. So all this temple, I mean, this is pillar that why it has survived. But if there's supposedly there's in a brick structure, so once I mean, once a massive fl flood I mean, for more than one thousand years, it was in a very uh, nobody was there to take care of it. So uh, it must have been like you know in in some massive flood, it must have been like you know brought down and now um, must be you know buried inside. So this is another second pillar. This pillar was discovered in 1909. Cunningham, Carlyle, and all the early excavators, they didn't have idea that uh, 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 Rampurva has got two pillars. Initially, till 1907, uh, Carlyle identified found this pillar, northern pillar, in 1975. He didn't have any clue that there's another pillar here. So, till 1907, people thought there is only one pillar. 
had cunningham carlyle all these people found another stupa another second pillar also then they would have also i mean thought the way we are thinking that i mean this could be the site of uh, buddha's mahaparinirvana but the second pillar the southern pillar this pillar was discovered very late in 1907 and again you can see this is layer of sand this is layer of earth this is sand again earth so like you know river was flowing above this pillar i mean on this uh, uh, flowing this uh, site for centuries so uh, uh, my 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 uh, submission is that uh, uh, all the ancient remains is should be in this area i mean uh, let me all the ancient remains of kasiya uh, kushinagar mahapranirvana should be here and city should be somewhere here like you know here i mean if they do some more excavation so i have based on my exploration i have discovered uh, i mean lots of pottery in this area but uh, i mean this needs uh, proper excavation proper exploration by i mean competent people archaeologists because i'm not an archaeologist so i mean people who, who are competent people if they do exploration in this area they can find more conclusive evidence so uh, again uh, according to shrenzan both the pillars were inscribed so we one of the pillars is uh, this pillar the northern pillar uh, this pillar the inscription are surviving but this pillar you can see uh, this part is chiseled i mean uh, so according to john marshall who visited this place in 1989 so he said that somebody has purposely i mean chiseled out the part which has we should have inscription you can see this is the southern pillar and you can see it has been purposely cut from this area where there was some inscription so shenzang says that both the pillars were inscribed so i mean uh, there is uh, ample proof that both the pillars were inscribed in fact and this is the aerial view of the site i mean this is a big mound here at uh, Ram, rampurwa and this is another mound and these are the two ashokan pillars first ashokan pillar the southern ashokan pillar was found here and another ashokan pillar was found here like it's like you know 300 meters uh, from here and from here they brought it here and they have kept they put it here for safety and uh, this is i mean like you know uh, as i said i mean all the ancient remains of ancient shrines at this place because this place didn't had many shrines it had few shrines but i mean and also these shrines were not very huge and big so uh, all these shrines i mean this is a, because of the river uh, i i noticed the, the, there was a section which was cut on the in the field and noticed all these remains in rampurwa so i mean if they do proper exploration they will find lots of ancient remains and uh, uh, this would be like you know conclusive evidence another thing is that like you know this is my last uh, slide and uh, um, this is like you know this uh, this is uh, gandak river ancient anuma so people who have read the buddhist text biographical text they will notice that uh, the great renunciation of buddha has very strongly mentioned about uh, uh, mentioned about uh, uh, river ganda this anuma and uh, uh, i mean this is a very integral part of the renunciation of the buddha uh, uh, river anuma yet uh, uh, kasiya is here so buddha started on his mahaparinirvana journey from vaishali and he has not mentioned about crossing this river to go to kasiya if kasiya is kushinagar then he should have crossed this anuma river he didn't mention i mean there is no mention he was already 80 he was fragile and uh, uh, if he crossed this river he would have definitely mentioned it instead if you if you notice i mean there are ashokan pillars on this side this is vaishali this is ariraj this is nandangarh and this is ashokan pillar this is uh, the, it seems this ashokan pillars are here to mark some great journey great march and most probably the mahaparinirvana journey of the buddha and ultimately it ends here i mean two ashokan pillars mentioned by shrenzan and so the point is like you know we don't uh, the all literature are silent about uh, buddha crossing anuma river in his mahaparinirvana journey and shrenzang description about uh, kushinagara also reaches us here two ashokan pillars at rampurwa when he starts from uh, kapilavastu goes to lumini and and uh, from here the place where buddha made, uh, stupa was related with renunciation and then charcoal stupa so i have made some offered some identification of uh, renunciation stupa and uh, charcoal stupa you, you can read the stories on my blog Uh, and uh, so distance direction everything about shrenzan reaches us rampurwa which has got two ashokan pillar and i mean we have now this another evidence that according to buddha according to mahaparinirvana sutta buddha didn't there is no mention of crossing river anuma so 
I mean, this whole, uh, I mean, this is not a very, uh, like, you know, conclusive evidence that Kasia is questioning. Rather, uh, I, I strongly think that uh, Rampurva has, uh, uh, I mean, this place to be more explored. And nowadays we have this technology of uh, ground penetrating radar. So, I mean, they can use those things and do exploration. And uh, maybe, I mean, that will reveal because I, I guess, I think that all the ancient remains are buried like, you know, seven or eight feet below the surface. Uh, because of this flooding. So these are the bibliography and people who are interested in knowing more about these sites. I mean, they can read here. And uh, these are my blogs. And uh, uh, this is uh, my blog link. This is the Facebook page. People who have not liked, I mean, who have not visited my Facebook page of this, uh, this uh, Retracing Bodhisattva Sattva Shrenzan project, please uh, visit my page and like it. And people who can support, please, uh, Pay. I mean, we have this portal where you can go and pay. So this is all I have to say. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Deepak. What an excellent lecture you have given. So after listening to your lecture, I have much clearer idea what is what really happened, you know. Uh, and also, we always think of uh, Alexander Cunningham as the one who discovered all the places. Then we, we found out that actually because the maps in India was not very well defined. Yeah. And if you have actually started on the wrong basis and uh, having make an announcement and all that, then you have to, uh, you know, it's almost like once you've already sunk in, it is a sunk investment. You have to try to find other things in order to connect. Yeah. And that is why yeah. they went completely off course. And then after that, they, had, they need to justify so if you go over to Kushinara and you don't find enough evidence, whatever little thing you can find, you use that to support the other things you kind of gloss over. Right. So this is really quite interesting, but it was good that later on, because of the discovery of Lumbini itself, it shifted the discovery to a completely different, different level. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe the first question that I can ask, I see that under the chat, there's no comments. Everybody was probably sitting and just listening to the lecture and not thinking of questions. What gave you the idea of looking at Rampua as a possible site for Koshenara? What was the thing that stimulated your, your thinking? I know, uh, basically, I, you know, I'm an engineer. so. Uh, when I was reading Swenzan's book, I, as a, just as a hobby, you know, I was I got so much interested. I read this book of Charles Allen, uh, Buddha and the Sahibs, and then I was reading this Swenzan book. So I thought of uh, putting all these places identified by Swenzan, I mean mentioned by Swenzan, on a GIS map. So when I was plotting this thing on GIS thing, I noticed that I mean this line from Lumini is not going toward Kasia. And then there was the identification of uh, Rama Grama in Nepal. So it was not fitting everything. So uh, then I started reading, I mean, Shrenzang mentions about these two Ashokan pillars. Then I read some archaeological reports and they mentioned that Rampurva is the place where there are two Ashokan pillars. And when I connected this dot, I mean, it was exactly taking there. Then I visited this site in 1912, in, 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 in 2012 and 2015. So then I got more and more convinced. This is how we started writing about uh, Rampurva should be the place of uh, Buddha's Mahapanirvana. And then, I mean, but, but there was again some missing gaps of the places where Buddha cut his hair and uh, um, like, you know, where Buddha, uh, this charcoal stupa should be. But uh, since this, I mean, I was not sure where Buddha and Bodhisattva Siddhartha, they crossed Gandak river, this Anuma river. So uh, during my journey, uh, food journey, I made a point to, uh, I mean, visit through Valmiki Nagar. Based on my study, I realized that, I mean, Buddha must have crossed Anuma river somewhere in Valmiki Nagar. And as uh, my hunch was there, the uh, hunch was there. And uh, I, uh, on my visit to Valmiki Nagar, I discovered those stupas of... Uh, um, uh, hair cutting and uh, exchange of robes. So, I mean, this further clarified that, I mean, yes, Rampurva should be the place. I mean, these two Ashokan pillars are conclusive evidence. I mean, not only distance and direction, which is taking us to Rampurva, but there are two Ashokan pillars, as mentioned by Strenzan, found there. So, I mean, this is, I mean, enough evidence to investigate further. I mean, my job is just to say all the evidence which we have. I mean, ultimately competent people like, you know, archaeological survey of India or archaeologists, I mean, now they have got all this equipment of ground penetrating radar. They should do all this study over the surface where are the ancient remains. And they should not hope to find big structures because, I mean, if you read whole book of Shrenzang and then you read Kushinagar, uh, um, a story about Kushinagar from Shrenzang and Fashian, they are very dry. I'm using this word dry. I mean, if you read this description about Sarnath, uh, Vaishali, 
uh, Shravasti, they are so full of life. I mean, Shrenza gives lots of description here and there because it was a lively place. I mean, there were Hmong community at Sankisa, uh, both Gaya. So there were lots of things happening. The shrines were very beautiful, very well maintained. But Ram, if you go to Kushiragar, he talks about the events which took place there. He doesn't talk about much about the shrines. Because shrines were not very happening, like, you know, they were in very bad shape, not like, you know, small, small stupas. And as I mentioned in this uh, talk that uh, this was not a chosen place. I mean, Buddha didn't choose that, oh, this is a beautiful place, let's, uh, let's attend Nirvana. It was just a chance. It was an accident. He was on his way to Kushinagar from Pawa. And then he was forced to not, he could not complete the full journey. So ultimately, he attended Nirvana in this, between Pawa and Kushinagar. And that is actually a flood prone area. Why would a Ashoka install these two Ashokan pillars in a flood, flood prone area? I mean, and there are mounds. I mean, there are mounds. And if you do some survey, I mean, some exploration, you will find pottery and pottery in neighboring fields. I think this is, this is an important discovery because Ashoka does not put pillars anywhere he likes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <that's true. laughs> and for the two uh, Ashoka pillars to appear together close yeah. to each other, must yeah. signify that the two events are connected to one another. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's true. Mm. That's true. So this is this is an important discovery. I'm still uh, looking at the chat, and it doesn't seem that anybody have have questions to ask so far. Maybe maybe question will come later. I mean, because yes. uh, what does it take uh, for us to encourage the Archaeological Society of India to do excavation in this place? Because the issue is like. You know, since 19, uh, 1907, 1909, they say, oh, okay, this is already settled. The Kushinara area has been landscaped. It is actually beautiful. As you can see from the starting uh, slide that, that, that you showed, it's a beautiful picture, <laughs> which, yeah. which, which uh, I took in the recent uh, pilgrimage. Yeah. And the whole place is done so well. Why mm -hmm. would they want to discover another place that's in a, in a kind of a river bed? Yeah, and if you read, I mean, there are only four or five reports of excavation at Kasia. And if you if you read the, the text, I mean, these people who excavated this site, they are not themselves very confident. I mean, they are always shaky and they are always, they are disappointed by the finds. I mean, they don't want to disclose because they are the excavator. They don't want to say openly, but in very silent words, they are saying that this is not conclusive evidence. Yes. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, John Marshall, the DG of Archaeological Survey of India, who initiated this excavation with this proposal that let's find some conclusive evidence and let's settle this debate forever. He doesn't issue any statement of final verdict that yes, we started this excavation with this question and we have found the answer. So this is concluded. He didn't say anything like that. I mean, it's still open for debate. Mm -hmm. and uh, But still nobody's questioning. I mean, like, you know, it's already more than 100 years. That this is very interesting because there was another place uh, where there seemed to be two, uh, you know, two sites connected to the Buddha. That's Kapila Vastu. One, yeah. in, one, one in Nepal and another in India. And now I think some explanation is just emerging because it used to be, oh, the right one is in India or the right one is in Nepal. But now you've got some kind of explanation to connect the two places. Now Kapila Vastu, now Kushinara, people have been going there for a pilgrimage and many people don't, don't even realize that the place is actually not confirmed. And you yeah. know, archaeologists, once they have actually written about it, once you become famous and that place actually become famous, you try not to disrupt things. And oh. some uh, archaeologists, of not, not, of this, uh, not of the Buddhist holy places, but other places, what they do sometimes is they even plant evidences in order to convince people that that is the right site. That's what some archaeologists have done, you know, in order to, to provide evidence so, I mean, now we're just reopening up the box again to say, hey, you know, this uh, issue has not been settled and maybe we should be looking elsewhere. If you keep digging in the same hole and if that's not the right hole, you're not going to find anything. You got yeah. to start looking for another place to start digging. And that okay. is what we are doing down here. Now, there is one, one chat. Let me just check what, what is here. Oh, so there are no questions from the Facebook Live. Wow. <laughs> okay, that must have come from Alex. So very interesting. So how can we encourage the Archaeological Society of India to do some work down here? Uh, my point is that, I mean, uh, I mean, it's very, because, I mean, again, it's a matter of geography, because the Kushinagar is in Uttar Pradesh, it's another state of India, and this Rampur is in Bihar, so now it's a matter of, like, you know, intrastate. So, uh, I mean, this... I don't see anything happening in the near future unless until state government of Bihar 
takes initiative on its own and does some initial field work of some like you know surveys mm -hmm. and then i mean this because we can do uh, awareness generation at a very smaller level like you know uh, and we don't have a say so maybe if government of bihar because this rampurwa lies in government in bihar state so maybe if government of bihar is interested they can initiate some uh, ground penetrating gpr study and if they found some conclusive evidence they can uh, ask government of india that i mean let's uh, this dispute was not settled in 1912 by john marshall so let's again reopen this case and uh, let's settle this dispute forever i mean for always so let's see i mean i'm hopeful because i mean generally i mean it takes time it took like you know 700 800 years for all this revolution so i mean it, it will take some time but i mean uh, people have started already going there i mean people now i mean somehow they think that i mean these two ashokan pillars are here not by chance yeah. it's not just chance that uh, ashoka took all this pain to bring all this uh, ashokan pillars here yeah. so i mean this is certainly a very important place yeah. what is the inscription on the other pillar what does it say it is like you know this uh, pillar inscription important uh, the seven pillar inscription so i mean like all the buddhas uh, the ashokas uh, talking about like you know dhamma and uh, i mean his okay. seven okay. so this is the uh, pillar inscriptions the because pillar i mean pillar, does not identify anything you know i mean yeah because i mean these pillars were installed before and this inscri inscriptions went later mm. So I mean, this is the theory. I do not know, but I mean, I read somewhere that pillars went. I mean, like you know, this uh, inscriptions went in twenty second year or twenty sixth year of his uh, Ashoka's coronation after coronation, and pillars were installed much before that. I mean, before that. So <laughs> I do not know. I mean, this this will be revealed only if more study is done there. Maybe what we should do is to encourage the government Bihar to say, yeah. can you please look into this? There are two Ashoka pillars lying in. in close uh, proximity to one another it must be something significant for the buddhist why don't you have a look to find out what this place really is yeah that's true mm -hmm. and of course uh, the state of uttar pradesh may not be too happy because all the buddhist sites seems to be in bihar <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, most of them most of them <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah 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 so so yeah very good very good i think we are just um we just about on time so if there are no questions and i see that there are actually no no questions from the participants maybe let me just uh, just conclude tonight's talk i find tonight's talk to be really fascinating the part i think you have given so well in describing actually the early parts then we can actually understand the whole thing in context and why you are uh, proposing that uh, this site of rampurwa is actually quite interesting for look us to look at because Uh, in terms of the terrain uh, we can actually understand why you're not going to find any major 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 monasteries like even both fasian as well as suanzang has some kind of description they don't fit into the uh, the yeah. current descriptions of of uh, of um, yeah. uh, kushinara but in this place with two uh, pillars and uh, you know they, they, it fitted uh, the uh, the narrative so well Yeah. And also, when you start mapping up where Pava is, where Kushinara is, and it seems it seems to coincide with the direction that uh, that Stan Chang was describing. Whereas, if you took the, the Kushinara that we go to, it doesn't fit into the narrative at all. <laughs> and even the archaeologists are at a loss. They have invested so much time and effort inside it, and they could not even find some conclusive uh, evidence. So, um, very interestingly, right at the start of this talk, we already. have taken a kind of a poll about 70% says they are happy to hear about this talk the remaining 30% remains kind of neutral mm -hmm. so um actually i think people should be positive about this because firstly don't you really want to find the actual site where the buddha passed away and if this rampurwa could actually be the site then it is it becomes a new place for us to go yeah then for some of you who have done pilgrimages like i myself have done for pilgrimages i would say that you don't lose anything by going to the current site because that place is very well built up and it must be a very sacred place and i think the indications is that that could be one of the relics of stupa yeah. or maybe the stupa where the ashes was collected by 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 donor the the brahmin who uh, distributed the uh, the ashes so if you have gone with a mind of devotion you have collected many a lot of merits 
even though that could not, even though that might not have been the actual place where the Buddha passed away. Then the other thing is that this discovery opens a door, I think, to the Indian Archaeological Society to start doing excavations for the uh, of Buddhist sites for future pilgrims. Because now India having the, the, the site of, you know, the Buddhist population in this world, uh, this is a very sizable. And uh, we could see that this potentially could open up new things because the discoveries that we have those are like 1900s, early 1900s, 1907, 1909, and everything more or less like a kind of a, a stop. Let us try to open up more. And in fact, this is, I would say, this is an uh, important discovery because what you, are, what you did, Deepak, is going through the Vishali uh, Kapilavastu trade route, concentrating on that because a lot of the uh, teachings of the Buddha, the Buddha's journey was around there. In right. the petroleum industry, we will say that you have struck oil. <laughs> <laughs> because if this indeed is uh, Koshinara, then there'll be other places that could actually be uncovered. So it becomes really interesting. So uh, the conclusion is that we should not be upset at all. We yeah. should not even be neutral. We should actually rejoice to say that this is like opening of something fresh, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, rather, rather, I mean, uh, Dr. V, I mean, the whole effort of this uh, retracing Bodhisattva Shrenzang for journey is to give a special status to entire Gangetic plane because made, when Buddha made his wandering in a whole of Gangetic plane. We know simply about 40, 45 places mentioned by Shrenzam because Shrenzam also could not visit all those shrines. But if you go in Gangetic plane, you will find so many stupas I and mean, remains everywhere in Gangetic plane in villages and cities. So the idea is in the next 30, 40 years, we should give a special status to the whole Gangetic plane, the state of UP and Bihar and uh, Haryana because Buddha made his wandering. It's a very special place. It's just that we know 45 places. Otherwise, Buddha walked in all these places. So the whole of the Gangetic place is place of celebration. Yes. And also, it will mean that for Buddhists who want to practice, you become more like Sun Chang. But Sun Chang actually loved India very much. Yeah, that's true. Really, that's true. For a longer duration in India, you know, spending places, different places where the Buddha spent. And yeah. through your meditation and reflection. And this is... This is something for the Buddhists to do. <laughs> and even even Fashian, if, if you read his text, yes. he was not willing to go back to China. Rather, yes. his companion, I mean, the, the two of them, they were, they, they were two people, two guys, two monks. So one of the monk, he stayed back. He said, I, I don't want to go back to China. I mean, I want to attend Nirvana in the place where Buddha was here. Yes. And Fashian says that I'm so unlucky. I'm so unfortunate because I have to carry this Vinaya text back to China. So I have to go. Otherwise, I would have chosen to stay here and attend Nirvana in India. So there was, there was a great uh, love for, among these people. Like, you know, even It Singh, who stayed at Nalanda, I mean, if you read his diaries, when he was living, he says, I mean, I mean, I, I have to go back. Yeah. But he, he says that I'm carrying all these memories. And when he go back, when he goes back there, he finds one mountain like something like Rajgir and Gridkut. So he says that this is my vulture speak. So, I mean, all these monks, there was a big, good cultural vibes between India and China in uh, until 10th, 11th century. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not, uh, so, <laughs> so now it could be people like Malaysia and Singaporeans and all that going over to India, spending more time there. Yeah. You know, everybody wants to go during the uh, cold season, during the cold season, during winter, and all concentrated within the three, four months. And only to the, these uh, designated places where it's really congested with, 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 with Buddhist pilgrims. If there are other places op uh, that are open up, then actually you know, the pilgrims could actually spread around. And uh, even during the rainy season, it's, it's still possible. It's still very pleasant uh, to do your yeah, meditation. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, Deepak, so thank you so much. Thank you. you know, thank you so much. I think it is an excellent uh, you know, talk. And uh, we will put this on the YouTube for the benefit of, of everybody else. <laughs> Thank you. On the Thank you. All right, Deepak. We I hope to hear from you again. You know, your journey is really very exciting. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, okay, everyone. Thank you so much. Please tell your friends. Uh, the recording of this uh, talk is, of course, on the BGF Facebook Live. So it is be there. And later on, we will, uh, you know, uh, put it on, on the YouTube. So this is something uh, that you could actually uh, introduce to your friends. All right. So with that, uh, let me wish all of you good night and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.